The idea is the last time it was I, I wanted that you to think about seeing that movie as being it. I mean I want to give you as close up view as I could. Uh, the movie served that purpose. Um, there's other movies app um, that are linked to in my book. There's one that does an analogous thing in Haiti. It's shorter, it's only 20 minutes. Uh, I don't think it's well done myself. And then there's one that's pretty nice by the World Bank, Voices of the Poor program, that has a whole sequence of countries, and I, I think it's a really worth watching. Um, it's not that long. And uh, so you, you can go to the book to see those sites. But we're gonna focus on um, uh, Guatemala today. I'm calling it Guatemala Close. You'll see that's a tradition in the way I'm working on this book in class, and that is, is I'm trying to give you an up-close view on the ground and then step back and look at the big picture. So next week we're gonna get into the big picture data of the way the world is operating today with respect to poverty and development. Um, today, we're gonna try to get um, an up-close view, as up-close a view as we can um, sitting in a comfortable classroom, okay? Um, the, I wanna orient you again here. Guatemala is, uh, they're south of Mexico, um, southwest of Belize, north of Honduras and El Salvador. Um, the uh, Montoni de Luz trip goes about right there, about where the D is. Um, so when you fly to Guatemala, you'll typically fly um, to um, Guatemala City um, and uh, drive as fast as you can to get out of the city and uh, end up here, that little light blue you hardly see is, is Lago Atitlan or Lake Atitlan. And that's Panachal, the largest uh, town on the lake. Um, and uh, it's uh, um, been called Gringo Tenango because it's a popular des travel destination for Americans. And uh, Tenango means in the indigenous language town. Um, so they, they uh, Chris and Zach got on the chicken bus. Chicken bus, by the way, is just a, well, they're, <coughs> they're sometimes it's painted, colorful. Sometimes they're yellow. They're typically school buses, old school buses from the U.S. They're sold to them and they're used down, down there. And they're, they're uh, so they got on the chicken bus mm -hmm. and drove over here. Um, Panajachel is right by Pena Blanca. Okay. And Panajachel is the location of the NGO, Mayan families, that um, the trip from OSU is going to. Okay. It's, it's a, so, um, and with, went with me to check that out this summer. Sydney Anderson right here. And where's Aaron? Aaron's back here. So we went down, us three, and uh, Mary Schur and uh, Randall Berkeley to check this place out as an, like an engineering assessment of was this a good site to work with. And indeed it was, so we're going to be going back in the summer. Um, we also went up to Chichicastenango, um, the beautiful market up there. We'll talk about that in a minute. So this has you um, sort of oriented, and you gotta, you got to realize a lot of mountains, these, this is called the highlands up here, okay? This is sometimes called the Central Highlands. Um, and uh, there's quite a number of volcanoes. The volcanoes around the lake are not active, but the volcano near Antigua, which is right here, which we also want to, is an active volcano. And there's smoke coming out of it and so forth. Okay, so that's where, where um, Pena Blanca is. So we viewed this movie, and these are two of the stars, um, Rosa and uh, Chino. So Rosa, I got an email just a couple weeks ago. She graduated from high school, um, actually. So she's on a track to do a nurse thing, okay? Um, so let's talk about this, um, the living on $1. And, you know, I'd like you to start out with sort of like your gut level emotional reaction. I know we don't talk about feelings in here. Yeah, they don't care what you do. Okay, when it comes to the class like this, or maybe you should think about it. Now, you may have even no feelings, but some people have feelings. I do. So I can start, I don't mind. See, I have this problem when I watch a movie. I think I've seen it eight times now. <laughs> and it still will bring a tear to my eye. Still does it. And it's, it's just, when, it, when you've been there, I've been there a couple times, <coughs> and when you've been there and seen it too, this movie is very realistic, okay? So and other people, um, emotional reactions. Any emotional reactions, or have you seen something similar? What? Guilt. Guilt.
Savings Club. There's much I've read about those. There's a fantastic book called Portfolios of the Poor, and uh, it describes these strategies. Holy cow! Some of them are much, much more complex than this. I mean, this attitude that people have sometimes. You talk to people, typically rich people, typically successful people. I th think that people are that poor people are stupid and lazy is simply absurd. I mean, it, that is such an absurd, arrogant perspective. I mean, these people are smart and they're trying to get by. Yes. Yes, Valerie. Shocking, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's for me, I think like that too with my kids. I'm like, if your kids could only get it. Yes, that's since 1949 after the war. That's the number.
A uh, very good question. In fact, there's a lot of people who are really pissed off about that. Um, one of the persons that articulates that well is uh, Bill Easterly. Um, we're going to cover some of his stuff um, later in the course. He's, he, he has that stat, and he, he, he would just say that a lot. Look, where this aid money um, uh, goes, it's not making it often on the ground. When the U.S. or another OECD or Europe gives money, the question is what percentage goes to the country? And you say, well, you think it goes to the country, all of it. Uh-uh. It goes to companies within the, the rich country to help the other country. And they consume a huge percentage of that aid. Okay? And therefore, it's not making it. Corruption in some countries, like Chad, it's not making it. We're not getting it on the ground. So there's been a lot of people upset about this over the years. Um, and uh, trying to get it to happen on the ground. That's why you're going to see in this class, we're going to emphasize working on the ground with real people. Very much so. That's a, a fundamental philosophy of the class. Yes? Yeah. And I guess that's just one thing that I felt like my whole life kind of doing something. So it was, it was kind of inspiring me to kind of like really like put more into this course and maybe actually try to do something like that at some point in my life. You can do it. That's good. What, what I will tell you is, is that in the beginning, it's a little more tough than after you've done it for a couple of years. A lot of, you know, concerns initially like safety. Um, it's a very different environment to walk into. Um, but you know, wherever I've been in the world, if you were just willing to talk to people, you're gonna like them. I mean, people are generally very nice. And they, it's fun for them to meet somebody from another country too. And so we're gonna be talking about those issues. But uh, I think you, you can really sort of get hooked on it because it, it can be a lot of fun if you do it right. Yes, there's one. Um, yeah, so this kind of reminds me Um, yeah, this is a, there's, a, I've seen some videos about this too, and uh, some people call it, you know, just say it's tourism. Some people call it poverty tourism. Um, and uh, a lot of people don't ask the crucial question, we'll talk about near the end of class, of this. so what did you give and what did you get? Did you get more than you gave? Did you go there and screw something up and make it worse for them than if you hadn't gone? You know, those are important questions. They're really important questions. Okay. All right, anything else? Okay, so next question. When you walk into these situations, there's there's a few things you're gonna come up with. You know, you're in the town, you're gonna you're gonna there's gonna be <coughs> relationships you're gonna try to build. I mean it was fantastic they got to know Anthony, for instance, this is one example, or Rosa or whatever. 
Cappuccino. Um, but you also want to observe their, their conditions of how they're living with respect to food, water, health, housing, etc. And which helps you understand? The answer is all of it. it it's a very, you're walking into an extremely complex situation, very hard to understand. I mean, just think, if they came up to your neighborhood, it'd be hard to understand. If they came to the United States, it'd be hard to understand. Well, it's just as complex and hard to understand there. So it, it, you have to just acknowledge that and say it's hard to understand, okay? Um, Somebody tell me, what did you notice with respect to girls? First of all, for women, girls, yes. Actually, um, I'll tell you to go look at Grammy and other. Turns out there's millions of people from those microclimates from that. So guess what? Um, Mohammed Yunus in Bangladesh started this. Got a full, Nobel Peace Prize for it, in fact. And he, uh, he, he told the problem. He started the program out, started loaning it to poor people, and he loaned it to men, women, whatever. So the men are paying it back. No, we are not. In fact, today, it's, it's around only 70% of men will pay it back and about 95% of women. Wrong with you? It's my gender. <laughs> I mean, yeah, true. And, and you know what they do now? A lot of them, the only ones are women, a lot of them. So actually, microfinance is quoted as one of the biggest uh, women's empowerment programs around uh, for, for, for women. And uh, it's just, just amazing. And so what are the men doing? What do you expect? They don't have to. I mean, these are big churches. They're, they're drinking and women. Okay? So, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a good program. Anybody else notice anything with women in In some countries, in some locations, that is true because the boys are taken out for hard labor. Okay, that's true. Um, but in some countries, culturally, um, because of religion or whatever reason, the girls aren't even sent to school. It turns out that worldwide, so come to the data, it's pretty shocking. Right now, primary school education around the world, percentage of girls that finish primary school, what would you guess? 90%. women here, they're in the traditional um, dress, okay? And uh, um, they're, they're in some ways the carriers of the culture. Because if you're, if you're down there, you'll find that there are men like Victor was in, uh, what was, was the other guy, Car Juan Carlos, that helped him with the Rabanos, um, who were dressed traditional, but not very men do. Very many men in Guatemala dress that way. 
it's it's the women. They ha they tend to they're all dressing this way. It seems okay. And uh, I don't know. I, I I will tell you that the data don't look good on Guatemala in terms of treatment of women. Okay, we'll come back to that next week. All right, they, they're actually pretty bad. Yes. I wonder about my gender. Um, okay, so let's talk about suffering for a minute. See, um, suffering is a complex issue. Um, you, you can't necessarily look at something and know that there's someone and know that they're suffering, right? Or whether they are or not. Sometimes you know. It's like, wow, of course. You know, like in that smoky, in the smoky little house, you know, I mean, that's suffering. You can, you can inhale all that smoke all the time. Parts of the, the cover, the, uh, the, the coverage by development economists. It, it's a very stressful life to be at this level, at below a dollar a day. It's very stressful because you're near the bottom, you're near not being able to have a meal. You know, we heard them talking about the kids not even being able to play, all this stuff. I mean, so it, I think it'd be an extremely stressful life. It, you would suffer a lot cognitively and physically. I think, I think both of those things are happening. Um, but you also, uh, then I've met some people like that are incredibly happy for where they're at, they appear to be at in life. You know, so don't don't underestimate, you know, the power of the human spirit and, you know, that. So um, solidarity we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, social mobility, uh, we talked about that. Rosa and wanting to be a nurse. Gina wanting to be a soccer star just like my son, um, and, uh, or a farmer. Um, so let's go, let's go technical now. Let's go challenge. What technologies could help? We have, we have, yes? Um, so my thing why I disagree. Uh, the ability to use things <coughs> that stick as far as like the parasites in the water to get like those beats that you get in those pretty little bad stuff. Like, let's go to get filters for throwing the air some alternative way to get water. Uh, the Guatemala project for OSU is assessing water filtration systems uh, for bacterial herpes and that. And uh, yeah, wa clean water is so crucial. We just turn on the tap and drink the water. You know, but you, in, down there, even if you're in a hotel, you don't turn on the tap and drink the water. I mean, there's problems that are pervasive with water in the country. So water, what next? Yeah, they might be able to use a better fertilizer. They might be able to some other methods from around the world. We have that. We have OSU Extension, right? That's what does it for the state of Ohio. That's called OSU Extension. They reach out to all the farmers of the whole state and I help them do better. Okay, you know, it would be nice. Yes. That big civil engineering problem, right? Yeah, or agriculture, right? Right. Others. Yes. Um, the wood burning stoves and heat sources. Energy efficiency over. and lack of pollution, exactly. Um, the Guatemala Project's doing uh, assessment of cook stoves for this area next, um, for next, the next trip. Others. So there's energy problems. Those people don't have electricity. Um, do you go down and install a grid? <laughs> Probably not. Okay, do you do personal electronics generation via bicycle? Maybe. Um, did, did Aaron or Sydney, did you see many of the people with cell phones? There weren't that many, were there? No, not really. 
No. Yeah, that's that's pretty indicative of a problem, actually. And they did like they were like shot almost like. Yeah. Like right. Right. Okay, um, other technology? I mean, we could go on and on here. I think, by the way, um, I don't know if you, you get this picture. I, I gotta say something about it. So the, these uh, circles are hats of people, and they're sitting in the market. Um, there's bananas, coffee. On the volcanoes around Lake Atitlan, there's coffee grown on hillsides. Um, and then there's all kinds of fruits and vegetables here. There's corn, et cetera. Um, they have some fantastic art um, down there, but anyway. Okay, so uh, question we're gonna be raising later in class is the issue of priority. So you walk in this, this uh, area and, and uh, you should not go in there and say, you need clean water. The right approach is to go in and discuss with everybody and say, what do you, what do you like to do? What's your challenges? And just listen. And, and let them say it. And uh, then work with them on that. Uh, we're going to be talking about that whole process of gathering opinions. It's a very well-established procedure. It's been used for many years. It was actually invented in Colombia. And uh, it's called particip participatory action research. Okay, So we'll get to that um, later in the class. You want to know their opinions because it's respectful. You want to know their opinions because you're going to do the right thing. Um, you want to work with them. So let's talk about um, that in a minute. Um, here, this is, of course, optional, but this is if you like. This is a solidarity challenge for you <coughs> or me. During the, taking this class, try one of the three bullets. Bread and water for one day a week. You eat a whole loaf of bread. I, I did that once for four months for fun. Uh, it's interesting, I will tell you. Um, you think, oh, big deal, it's, you're just gonna get hungry. Uh, there's more to it than that. It's, it, first time you do it, it's almost scary, a little bit, I'll admit. Because it's like, how am I gonna do this? Am I really gonna be able to do this and not eat for 24 hours besides bread and water? And uh, you can, of course, but it does affect you. It affects you a, li a, a little bit cognitively and it certainly affects your, your get up and go, okay? So there's other ways to do this. Um, you can live on a dollar a day for one day a week, or, or maybe two dollars a day, or just go with a dollar a day of bread. So a dollar a day of bread is about two thirds of a loaf of white bread at a typical cost from a grocery store. Um, brown bread, brown bread can be four dollars a loaf. You only get a quarter of a loaf if you eat healthy. Poor people are faced with that same issue, okay? They've studied, in the United States, people say, you, you, you ever ask the question, why does it tend to be that people on the lower end of on po poorer people in the United States tend to be overweight? Why? And there's a good reason why, because if you analyze what's available in the grocery store and look at the cost per calorie, it's all fattening stuff. In other words, you can buy calories. The cheapest calories are fattening calories, and that's raised the weights of people. So it's actually a bad sign to see, you know, or in this case, Another option would be um, to, to get to know someone better. I mean, get outside your comfort zone with your friends. I mean, somebody in this class, get to know um, somebody from India or Latin America or Africa. We have several people from Africa, like Mr. Eritrea, right? Yep. He would welcome getting to know you and tell you about Eritrea, okay? So, so look, I mean, I, I think it'd be really good on your team to try to get to know somebody that's um, diverse. <laughs> Why do this? Why come to understand hunger? Um, well, it gives you an understanding. It sort of provides you a connection to people. It, it actually promotes compassion. You're gonna see, hear me repeat this statement a couple times in class. And uh, that is, you can't um, help solve the messy problems of the world without being a part of the mess. Okay? I think it's really true. That's a very, I mean, that's a, that's a tough statement in a certain way. And I've, had it, I've had it said in the context of safety. You know, people are really concerned about safety. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I mean, if, if you are not even gonna go there, you know, and be a part of the mess, you can't solve the mess. It also says, if you aren't a part of the mess, how can you understand the mess to be able to help fix the mess? Okay? Um, okay, so we'll, we'll be coming back to that idea. 
Um, next thing is a language issue. This might sound funny and a little touchy feely, but I think language is really important in this field, and what you call people and communities. Um, you know, they're people, they're normal people. Call them by their names, Chino, Antonio, and Rosa. Um, now, the problem is this word poor just stinks. Um, some people would like to say, refer to people who are poor rather than poor people to emphasize their humanity before their situation. However, like they would say, rather than a homeless person, a, per a person who is homeless, or um, the problem though with this poor word is, is it means something different to everybody. A lot of you might say, well, it means low income. I don't know. It, it means more than that to some people. It means something without. It means something just like an education, for instance. But what does poor mean? Okay, so if you say to someone you're poor or your community's poor, they might look at you and laugh and say, no, I'm not. And you might be like, what? You're making less than a dollar a day. We're all happy. We don't, we're not poor. We're, we're, we have a wealth of spirit and happiness. That's our definition. So you can be offensive if you call people things, okay? So you got to be careful with how you do this. Now, I, I've struggled with this. I still need, like when I write this book, a way to refer to people. Okay, so getting help from my wife, who's a child psychologist and my collaborator over in social work, we use this word client. Okay, it's not a perfect term, I don't think, um, but it's a pretty good term. And uh, it's used by some very large professions in the United States. Um, and so I will be using that. So generally, it's not a good idea to label people, walk into these communities and say that they're poor and so forth. You just talk to them as if they're people. Uh, next thing, there's a problem with respect to some of the words. Uh, often it's okay to say helping people or working with people. There's a lot of people that are, do not like the word service, even though it's used all over the place. They find it offensive. Why? Because service means I, I'm helping you. That means you're in need and I'm superior to you and I'm helping you out. What do you mean you're serving me? Baloney. That could piss people off. So don't. Try to avoid the term. I'll, it, it might sneak in once in a while when I, because there's a lot of literature that still uses the term, but some people really get upset by this term. So I will be avoiding it. Um, I would avoid saying I'm going to solve their problems or fix their problems. Um, you might say I'm working on a client's issue or addressing community identified challenges with a technology. Now, the word need is another word that's sort of like um, some people don't like because th that would imply I'm a needy person. I'm not a needy person. Antonio's doing fine by himself. Thank you very much. Okay? So, but other, other times it's quite okay. And the literature even like from social work will use the term needs. Okay? So I will tend to use that. Um, sometimes it's good just to say we're working together to address our challenges. So you would say, wait a minute. They have the challenges. I don't have any challenge. But the reality is, is most of the time we do have a challenge because it's challenging to work in these kind of communities, number one. And number two, if you think about it, if you guys, if you guys go on one of these trips to Honduras or Guatemala or whatever, you're going there to learn. I mean, you're in a university. So you're going to learn a bunch of stuff. You learn a lot, okay? And uh, your challenge is, is to do good learning when you're on a trip like this. And at the same time, you want to help. Okay, that's, that's tricky actually. So I like, I like uh, terminology like this myself. We cooperated with Chino, Anthony, and Rosa to develop a technology. Now, I'm, I'm being careful there in my choice of people, actually. Notice that I'm including a child. <coughs> UNICEF wants that to happen, okay? This is not unusual to have a child involved in a respectful and appropriate way, of course. Anthony involved, I mean, obviously he's a good dude, okay? and Rosa. So there's diversity there in age, gender, etc. Okay? And and you can learn a lot. You know, if you go into a community and you get, you know, there's a let's say it's a male leader typically, and they're going to say what they want. Now, are they going to really be saying what the community needs or are they going to be saying what they want to help themselves? If you ask the women in the community versus the men in the community, what will they want? If in microfinance, the men aren't taking care of the family and using the money right, and the women are, well, who should we be talking to? The women. Everybody, in development, everybody's saying that. International development, they're going to the women because it's working. Because the women 
are then taking care of the kids and the family and so forth. That's just the reality on the ground right now. Um, and so you, you, that can be difficult though because how can you go in there and if you have the male leader and you suggest having the women on board and he, and he simply says, no, we don't do that here. What do you do? How do you respect? Now, some programs actually walk in, set the rules in the beginning and say, women must be included, period, or we don't work with you, okay? But then you're, there's a conflict of culture, right? Same comments hold with respect to minorities of all types, okay? There's always, there's always issues of minorities, okay? There's minorities of all types, underrepresented groups, whether it's with respect to uh, race, uh, class, uh, religion, whatever it is. Same comments all hold for that, too. It's not just women. You want a diversity of thought, right? Diversity generates good ideas, right? And, and in the end, you do a better um, job. Okay, so we went to um, the community as good as we could via the video. And we'll talk about a few humanitarian engineering things, technology, labels, etc. Now let's step back and look at the country a little bit, okay? So the broader context in Guatemala. Uh, this is, uh, well, where should I start? This is like the Titlan you saw in the movie, um, and the volcanoes, uh, San Pedro, Coleman, and Titlan. And um, this picture is, uh, Peña Blanco would be over here, okay, a bit. Um, Parachel, like over here, okay, which is close by. Um, north there, this is Chichi, oh, I'm sorry, this is, this is Parachel, no, that's the, 10,000 person town that's right next to there and uh, right where my own family is, the NGO we're working with. Um, very standard um, street. Um, this is uh, along the sides, they have a lot of the souvenir shops and little shops and stuff like that. Nice. The big market though is up at Chichi Castanango. This is, this is Chichi Castanango. Are they called Chichi? This is Chichi. Um, and you can get like anything in the market and it's, it's interesting because, well, some of the things I'm pa I passed around are from Chi Chi, but um, these, it's the girls and the women that run around and sell you things. And whoo, they're, they're tough. I mean, they're gonna get that sale. <laughs> and uh, especially the, the little girls. Um, oh, geez, it's really, it's so hard to say, no, I don't want that. And then what's bad about it is if you say no, well, they'll follow you, and they know in just enough English to say, and they'll start lowering a price. And you say no again, they lower a price again, 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 again. And before you know it, you're like one quarter of their price. And then you feel bad buying it because, <laughs> you know, it's not like we're talking about a dollar versus 25 cents, okay? And you're, you're sort of like, and so you hand them a dollar and say, it's okay, you know. Um, but they're, they're very good at getting sales, these kids, okay? Um, this is Antigua which is the old capital of Guatemala. And uh, this is the active volcano in uh, the area. Um, that you can't see the top because of the clouds. Um, it's absolutely beautiful um, area. Um, okay, so that set your context a little. These are all from that, the area of um, Peña Blanca. Okay, within uh, about, within an hour and a half about, so two hours of, of Peña Blanca. Um, so, then there's the bad side of things, the big picture. Uh, okay, first of all, there's a huge discrimination problem between the mestizos and the indigenous. 40% are indigenous, okay? And uh, that, remember, I didn't point out the slide, but let's talk about numbers a little bit. Um, 16 million in Guatemala, around 40, 11 and a half million in Ohio. Land masses of Ohio and Guatemala are almost the same. So if you think of it, it's Ohio. 40% of Ohio were indigenous, okay, and they're really discriminated against. I mean, you can imagine they're black spots, okay. And, uh, you know, discrimination, I don't know about you people, but in my talking to people around the world, I like to get in conversations about tough issues you know, with people from around the world. And you know what seems to be a pattern that's just so depressing to me? If, if it is the case that you want your group, whatever it is, won a war against another group, Okay. Or if one group enslaved another group and mistreated them some way, and now that's ended, supposedly, it's continued by discrimination. 
It's sort of like, so let's just kill a bunch of them and then let's step on them for a few centuries. It's that bad. It really is. That example applies to Japan, um, <laughs> to many cultures. And if you're from a country and you think there's no racism, you got a real problem. There's racism in every country, right? India, right? I mean, that, there's a, I, I had a real good Indian friend who told me, look, Kevin, I was never discriminating, I've never been discriminating against the United States. I was discriminating against poor people. some places it's much more extreme in the sense that the people are really mistreated, okay? In other places it's less extreme. So we have this problem of the war. Um, I know you can go back in history in the 50s, um, CIA assassinated uh, their president, and this is what known. I mean, this isn't like controversial, this is known. And uh, it led to a bunch of dictators, it was really bad. And then uh, what happened in the 80s it is, um, the CIA and the U.S. government um, orchestrated, you know, coups, and then they provided weapons and training um, for the government. Unfortunately, then they were militarily supporting a genocide. Okay, and they don't—they don't know exactly the number of people um, that were killed, but um, the Mayans. Look at that number. A lot. They just round it off. Some people say two hundred fifty thousand. I say 200,000, but I've never seen anybody say less than 200,000. Whew. And this is men, women, and children. This is, this is the military walking with our guns from the United States, walking into the village and mowing everybody down. Putting them in a mass grave. Here's the mass graves. Like, here's the mass graves. This is going on in the news still, in the sense that they're trying to prosecute Rio Small, the, one of the, the, the presidents that did this stuff. Okay? Um, and, uh, it's, it's just simply nasty stuff. Um, so there was 450 Mayan villages um, that were destroyed. A million people were displaced. So peace came in 1996, but it, it was tenuous for a number of years. It may still be that way. But imagine this. So they had a bishop there, Juan Giraldi, was assassinated in 1998 um, for the Catholic Church report on the atrocities. Could you imagine if a, a religious figure in the United States was assassinated? What would happen? I mean, it, this would be shocking. Um, and you say, I still don't believe it. The U.S. does nothing but good. Mm. President Clinton formally apologized in 1999. I went and looked up the quotes. He said it was wrong. The U.S. must not repeat that mistake. I know he was there, too, because you know, I was in a restaurant in, in uh, Antigua, and he s there was this picture with his signature because he visited there in that year. Um, so 200,000 Mayans partly assisted by us in, in the killings. And uh, you know, to get a grasp on this, I was trying to relate it back to Ohio. So that's roughly in 2014 popula population of Akron, Ohio. We like it if you walked in there just killed everyone. Okay. So why does this matter? Is this just I'm not trying to beat up on the US. You know, I love my country. We got problems, but I'm just saying that. You need to understand, when you're walking into the situation, how is Victor going to feel about you and Prosai when, when they, know, they know all this stuff? They were on the bad end of it. How are they going to feel about you? You're coming to help me? You think they're going to trust you? I mean, it might be really hard for them to trust you. Okay? So, so uh, of course, children trust you and you sort of, you know, but I'm talking about the older people, how they might view you. These are very difficult things to talk about, too, I mean, with, with people. And then now it's still going on. I mean, CAFTA is a Central American Free Trade Agreement. Um, the, the people, okay, they don't like that. You think they like that? You think it's good for them? Who do you think negotiates those trade agreements? It's the rich in the country, okay? So they're not in their best interest. A uh, free trade agreement with Colombia. We could get into discussion about that. Um, so it is relevant, especially for older people to remember this. And they remember people like us. Um, Rigoberta Menchu. Um, so she tried to fight about against this and uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 92. She has a, a book she wrote, I, Rigoberta Menchu. Um, 
So you'd say, wait a minute, am I in an engineering class or what? Well, the problem is it, everything here is relevant because if you're going to go work with people, you need to understand history and context and culture and all this. And it is very difficult because there's all kinds of context I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about what's, what's other cultural context. I'm trying to provide it by, you know, passing around their beautiful art. But there's religion. Okay, so what, what are they doing in religion in Guatemala? Well, Catholicism Christian, or Christianity, Protestantism. There's other, you know, the Pentecostals are there or whatever. You know, there's other things like that. Okay, so there's all kinds of um, different uh, things that make up culture and context that matter that matter to you. So, <clears throat> next. When you enter a situation like Guatemala, the first thing you have to realize is there's only a subset of issues you can address as an engineer. There are other things, forget it. They're very different. They're irrelevant, thank you. They're irrelevant to whether it's something you can solve, okay? So somebody named for me that something that we saw that cannot be addressed with technology is impossible. Yes? Corruption. Oh yeah, well, weather and Things natural like disasters and the flooding that we had due to the hurricane. And yeah, those are certainly um, problems. I think discrimination is, is a good one. There's, there's a lot of things you can't do. A lot of those are socio, social type of things. You know, that you just, shh. I think it's important to say this because I think engineers too often think that everything in the world has a technological solution. And it does. I mean, not yet. Okay. Next, I got my own examples. Just, we're almost done. We got five minutes. This is Chichicasconango. Right here, these are the stairs. Going up to the church, the end of the market. <laughs> I knew I'd do this. That's my son. <coughs> Um, that's my wife, Anne, and uh, that's in 2003, as you see in February 4th, and uh, so <coughs> Zach is from there, and uh, he's 12, um, and I can't show you the next picture. That's the rest of my family. So, um, I wanted to close on this slide. I want Anybody else seen poverty up close? Yes. Um, well, I said earlier that I want to move to Zambia, and uh, I work in community. Um, uh, I support community, and I work particularly for small children and people who are. And um, I don't know, they they didn't have much money or anything, but like you said earlier, a lot of them were happier than they could think of. Yeah. Yeah, like were they stuck? Yeah. Yeah. Universe? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm originally from Ethiopia. And from where? Ethiopia. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I'm just curious what I think of it. Uh, I was recently working at the Apple Center, and one of the things that, that I noticed was that Ethiopia has like a huge uh, pro uh, problem. And one of the problems is that the way you can avoid it is by having good housing.
you, you understand it well. It matters a lot seeing it or growing up in it. Growing up in it especially helps you understand. I mean, it, it, uh, it changes your whole perspective on things. Um, that's for sure. Anybody else? Power your folks. Yes. And you sort of think, well, sanitation is not that important. I mean, like in, in these places we visited in Guatemala, they didn't have uh, you know, toilets and bathrooms and such. And we just go out in the field. And you think, big deal, you know, fertilizer. And not quite, because when it rains, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get in the water. And it's terrible. You know, water and sanitation, they're, they're very tightly coupled. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, the numbers are terrible on sanitation worldwide. It's over 2 billion people. Don't have proper sanitation. Yeah, one of the things in the United States, they have water tanks and how many people can drink water. Oh. Um, but they can cancel that. They have to wash the clothes and drink the water out of the freezer all the time. Um, that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. We, 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 take for granted that, you know, this uh, Benergy Duffalo treatment, we'll talk more about that. It's very hard, it's, it's like we take for granted, somebody brought that up, you're taking things for granted. You know, you go into your house or your apartment and everything just comes to you. Clean water, sanitation, you, you go to the grocery store, food's right there, and everything just, just happens. None of that just happens <laughs> in many environments in the world. But it's, it's just incredible. So anyway, let me try this again. That Zach we adopted in uh, 2003 and, uh, from Guatemala, from Guatemala City. And uh, you know, I always, I did that, that same thing last year. You know, I don't care, I'm not getting embarrassed anymore, I'm too old to get embarrassed. But I'd like to at least explain, you know, we are not good enough in robotics yet to create robotic parents, okay? There's no such thing as technological solution for orphans, okay? That's just absurd, okay? Um, there's all kinds of reasons why you know, children become orphans. And it's depressing how many are in the world. <laughs> we'll talk about data. But, um, you know, so there are things that you can do, you know, uh, along these lines to help um, that, are, that have nothing to do with technology, absolutely nothing to do with technology. The other three children are from Colombia. Anyway, all right. We'll see you, not on Monday, because it's Dr. King Day. Guys, <coughs> okay, so we're going to be... Um